Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio on April Fool's Day, April 1st, 2015. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, broadcasting every Wednesday from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. Today, though, the uh, show probably won't be a full two hours. I have it scheduled for 90 minutes. Ben Hansen, my guest, is only going to be on for about half an hour, and then I'm going to do the rest of the show. Talking about UFOs and uh, what they are, what they aren't. There's an article on In5D.com that I'll be using as a source for that. So um, you'll all be listening to me after the first uh, 40 minutes or so of this interview for I don't know how long. But Ben Ben Hansen is the um, guest on the show today. He's best known for the uh, visual technology and night vision uh, work that he does to identify UFOs and other things in the sky. And he um, does work involving Bigfoot, UFOs, ghost events. I'll be talking about all those things on the fly in the show quickly. Probably give my own thoughts on that. Later on, he's not in the queue yet. Um, hopefully, he'll be calling in soon. Uh, told him I covered news for the first five minutes. So, with that being said, I better get to this. Uh, do this on the fly. Alex Jones and company uh, will provide the news as usual. So, uh, first article on Infowars.com: Police men who beat train passenger Mike. Uh, excuse me, police um, men who beat train passenger for Mike Brown, not charged with hate crime. Men involved in beating receive misdemeanor assault charge. Um, Yes, I'm uh, not sure what the details are, not sure what the uh, guy's um, races were in this um, in this specific case, but uh just goes to show the hypocrisy that some people, uh, when they do uh, do assaults and things like that to certain people, they will get charged with a hate crime, but other times it won't be a hate crime. There's a lot of things about hate crime legislation that many people don't like, but moving on. Obama using your tax dollars to, quote, resettle, unquote, Central Americans – in the United States, bypassing a dangerous border with resettlement assistance and permanent residency program. Yes, uh, these are illegal immigrants, these people that they're letting in. Wish people could be able to cross borders and dock their boats into ports without any government permission or paperwork filing. Unfortunately, not all borders are created equal, so anyone could make the argument there has to be a process for, for immigration. So it's not like we're bordering Switzerland. Mexico is a much more dangerous country in regards to a no, no offense or anything to Mexicans. It's just the uh, the things going on down there are nothing like the um, things going on in some other countries with uh, gang wars and the government. The Mexican government is involved with a lot of that, no question. But the um, point is they're bringing the Central Americans and Mexicans in to take our jobs, among other things. And we can't let that happen because it is a conspiracy on the government to bring illegal immigrants into this country and impoverish us. All right, next article. Report, Obama wanted to release Taliban 5 without Bergdahl in return. Prior to Bergdahl's disappearance, Obama planned to release al-Qaeda-linked fighters to empty out Gitmo. Yes, um, of course, he would want to release the Taliban, considering that uh, that the U.S. government and the Taliban are um, in league with each other. And this whole Bergdahl thing, yeah, apparently he, he is a traitor, but... Um, this whole thing about training Bergdahl for, for Al-Qaeda, for Taliban people, it would anybody who has any shred of common sense could tell you that uh, that doesn't make sense if we're supposed to be Al-Qaeda's enemy. No, Al-Qaeda might as, be called, might as well be called Al-Qaeda. Okay, the next article. Hate speech. YouTube deletes viral anti-feminist video. A controversial clip showed men defending themselves against violent women. Yes, the uh, feminist movement is a fraud. It wants to uh, divide and conquer us. So something that is anti-feminist would probably get Deleted, no no surprise there. All right, enough of that. Moving on. U.S. House candidate says militia is on high alert in response to Jade Helm. Greg Palin says a reliable, well-connected inside source has told him militias are on high alert for military exercise. Yes, uh, these militias, uh, they're not government-run militias. They're militias by the people. Well, uh, the militia isn't as popular as it was back in the day when this country was founded, and a lot of people are too apathetic to be in a militia, but we hopefully will change that. I mean, you should learn how to use a gun if you're going to um, be in the militia. So, um, uh, folks, just a second. I hear that I see that a uh, shockwave has uh, crashed on my computer. Um, I'm going to actually uh, sign on. Um, I see Ben Hansen is in the queue there, so let me just uh, get on Blog Talk Radio on a uh, Mozilla Firefox because that would probably be better. To uh, sorry if I'm delaying you, Ben. Here, it's just that. Uh, I need to uh, get on Mozilla Firefox because uh, call the phone 
because uh, that won't flash shockwave won't crash on Mozilla like it would on a on Google Chrome. Well, actually, uh, just a second here. Uh, I'm going to get Ben on see if maybe you can hear me. Ben Hanson, you're on the air. Can you actually hear me now? I can. How you doing? Yeah, good. Uh, sorry about that. It's just that I see on my computer says Shockwave Flash has crashed, so I kind of wanted to uh, go on Mozilla Firefox. So uh, can you just um, just make sure this doesn't become a problem because it actually might in a little bit. Can you just hold on a minute so I can just um, put us on mute and go on, sure, to sign on Mozilla Firefox? All right. You'll be off for just a moment. Okay, Ben, can you hear me? I can. Okay, oh, now we're going. Hopefully this won't become a problem on Mozilla Firefox. But uh, I'm going to cut the news short. And besides, you only wanted half an hour, so I probably shouldn't have done all the articles any, anyway. So um, uh, just to start off, uh, we probably have to do this on the fly because it's only half an hour. Before I let you go, though, I'll uh, ask you if you want to do another show at some other time, maybe half an, another half an hour show or so. But uh, um, you are probably best known for the uh, night vision technology. I believe that was what your um, MUFON uh, commerce presentation was about. I was at that conference, the one in uh, Cherry Hill, so I did see your presentation, even though I may not remember everything from it. Oh, yeah. So um, let us uh, talk about night vision. To, so you got the floor on this subject. Well, it's it's kind of funny because um, you're having computer problems. I'm having computer problems. <laughs> I just got off the phone with a, a hosting company for my website, uh, Night Vision Ops, and the website is down because somebody hacked into it and they've been sending out porn. <laughs> so uh, very, very frustrating, and there's a special place for people like that. Um, at any rate, yeah, it uh, my my company Night Vision Ops is um, primarily you know I got into it because I wanted um, to find solutions for for people who do sky watching and ghost hunting and things like that so they can actually film onto night vision and um, or from night vision and thermal equipment and get the best um, you know images possible. Um, I, I'm on. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm going to be on mute every single time uh, you're talking. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so let's take this uh, bit by bit here. Bigfoot first, and then UFOs and ghost events. Okay, so what is Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch, also known as Yetis, if you're talking about the Himalayan area? Well, a couple of things on this. Uh, when I had John Lear on my show, he talked about how there is a species of uh, Sasquatch that is on Mars that was brought to Earth, which well, could be possible, because in my interview with Alfred Weber, he talked about how, yeah, there is life on Mars. It's a big cover-up there, and he has a whole booklet of uh, different species. I don't remember if there was a Sasquatch in that, but um, also, the majority of Sasquatch Sasquatch, anyway, it is said, and my source for this is my number one source, Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartzis, who said that uh, um, the creature we know of as Sasquatch is actually higher dimensional entities that is um, coming coming down into this dimension, this density, temporarily to incarnate as a Sasquatch creature in order to wake up humanity to the fact that paranormal things exist. And I wonder if the same thing is true with the uh, Loch Ness Monster, perhaps. But, okay, I'm not going to get into that. But in regards to that theory about Bigfoot and how it ties into your work um, and also your general work on it, what do you have to say about that? Uh, well, I, I guess in regards to John Lear and some of the far-out theories like that, he's he's an interesting guy. Um, <laughs> he's on on one hand, you know, has been in a position with his family and 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 things that he he may know more than the average person, but completely unfounded to talk about some of the wild theories he has about the dark side of the moon or creatures coming from Mars and um. You can say anything, but but it, there's there's not a shred of evidence I think to support something like that. Um, I, I do think there's a possibility. I'm open to um, Bigfoot theories. I, I think we're seeing more blending from those in the camp of you know this is simply an undiscovered creature, and then those who are more open to uh, it being some type of interdimensional, you know, type of a thing. For me, I think there is something to it. Um, I just don't know that it's an undiscovered creature. Like Lake Monsters, you mentioned. I, I find it very difficult to believe that there's, you know, a prehistoric um, type of an animal, you know, living 
in in a landlocked man-made lake that's been there for millions of years and same thing with bigfoot i think somebody probably would have shot one by now and um i've been told that they can die and they can bleed but everyone who's made claims that they've had bodies is has come up with nothing so as crazy as it sounds i think it's it's actually more plausible if there is something to it that the creature is sometimes there and sometimes not you know so there's there's got to be some other explanation for it Ryan, I seem to recall Linda Moulton Howe once saying that some guy tried to uh, shoot a Sasquatch, and then as soon as he shot it, it disappeared. Well, that kind of makes the theory that I mentioned earlier about how it's a higher dimensional entity temporarily incarnating as an ape-like creature to wake us up to the fact that paranormal things exist. I mean, if you're shooting it and you can't kill it, then uh, then that, that might make sense. But you're saying there are some that people have... Um, have been able to um, make bleed or, or whatever. So I guess uh, not every theory is true for every single species of Sasquatch out there. But um, I guess we'll go on to the uh, next subject, um, UFOs. Well, what are most of the UFOs nowadays um, is a question many would ask. Well, it's a percentage factor. In my interview with uh, George Kavosilis, he said that um, the majority of UFOs that we see our military industrial complex related and John Lear did uh, claim in my interview with him that all military industrial complex UFOs do have some extraterrestrial nexus connection at some nexus level. So there are other um, UFOs out there that are from other dimensions, densities, and also from other planets that are strictly ET run, but not part of the military because there's good ETs out there that like us that are watching over us as the theory goes. So now that I've made it clear that UFOs, it's a percentage factor into what they are and where they come from and who's controlling them. And um, what do you have to um, say about that and how it ties into your work? Well, I I wouldn't make ever such grand claims like, uh, you know, John Lear does. But as a percentage factor, I would still say that it's it's about 95% um, of sightings are, are the same that, you know, Blue Book had uh, estimated are either explainable as, as natural phenomenon or hoaxes. We're seeing more hoaxes nowadays. Of those that, that aren't explainable, um, it, it's really hard to say. I mean, I, I don't know who's piloting them. I would find it hard to believe that that most of them would be military, though, to be honest, because um, if they were trying to keep it a secret, I, I don't see any reason why they would be um, displaying them over you know, heavily populated areas with, with thousands of people. And uh, it doesn't really make sense when they have a, a whole lot of other um, testing, you know, areas they can go to. For example, the two things that, that I've seen were close to military bases, but uh, they were well overpopulated areas and doing extraordinary things. So to me, that doesn't really make sense. And, um, at the end of the day, though, I, I I can't tell you who's piloting them, but it, it would be hard for for me to believe that it was it was all military, right? And the thing that Stan Friedman, one thing he's talked about that's kind of been controversial, he asserts that even though there's definitely a government UFO cover up, the UFOs that are owned by the government are not controlled by the military. And his argument is, if it was controlled by the military, then we would have used them in the wars. Well, when I had John Lear, Bill Burns, and John Ventry on my show, they all asserted the reason we never used them in the wars is because we didn't have to. Cause it was, there was so much more less sophisticated down-to-earth technology going on that you wouldn't have to get the UFOs out. Not only that, all the wars are illusions because the powers that be are controlling both sides. So if the side they didn't want to win the war was going to use the UFOs, then the powers that be would come out from behind the curtain and say, ah, 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 you're not going to use that UFO technology with us controlling this war. And they, and if, even if the, the ones they didn't want did want to win the war had UFO technology, they wouldn't use it because, well, they didn't have to. So do you agree with the assertion we didn't use the UFOs in wars because we, we didn't have to? Well, I, I think if we do possess the technology, and I think I – think, um, it's very plausible that we have reverse engineered things and we have toys that are far beyond, you know, our, our latest and greatest that people know about. I, I think that's very possible. Um, and it, it would make sense that it, it's so far beyond what our enemies have. I don't know that there's any grand master controlling both sides of the wars, but, but I think for example, if the U S does have that technology 
it wouldn't make sense to bring it out. Um, it, it's it's like you know the the nuclear um, uh, bomb. We we brought that out. It was developed right at the right time. Um, it was used as a tool of last resort. And and I think if if we felt like we could have achieved the war in any other way to end it quicker, without having to bring that out in the uh, the risks of our enemies knowing that it, number one that it exists and number two that they could possibly develop their own, I don't think we would have taken that risk unless we had to. And so kind of following the same mindset, um, we we're still although China is is rapidly advancing i think we're we're still clearly the world's superpower and it wouldn't it wouldn't be necessary at this point um but but who knows you know things things are are changing rapidly all right let's move on to um ghost events what is a ghost well um there's that whole um pop culture idea that ghosts are entities with unfinished business they didn't do something in their life so they have to incarnate as a ghost before they move on to a more pleasurable afterlife. That's one theory, and there's also, um, well, a lot of um, places people claim they hear ghosts and see ghosts, like the Colosseum in Rome. Countless people say that when you walk by the Colosseum, you can um, hear ghosts um, uh, and maybe even see ghosts on a few occasions, people crying and moaning from the torture. And also, um, some people have talked about the New World Trade Center uh, uh, building in New York, it's almost like you can see and hear ghosts. Some people claim they've seen, like, it's the people that died on 9-11. Their um, souls have um, returned at a ground zero, and it's uh, and it's prominent at some level on that new building that they built. Make of that whatever you will. But uh, this whole thing about ghosts, what they are, and how it ties in directly with your work, tell us about that. Um, yeah, well, what what they are, I've... I've always kind of assumed and I really have no, you know, direct evidence of it other than, um, you know, when you go to a haunted location and you, you hear stories of, of what possibly could have happened or you start getting evidence and then find out later, you know, what the historical fact was, it seems like that ghosts are, um, residual, um, and active spirits, you know, that, that, uh, remain in a certain location for whatever reason sometimes it can be transitory to to follow individuals across the world typically they they tend to be in the same place it seems like um i don't know that they were either most familiar with in life or some place that drew them whether it's an addiction or you know people talk about them being stuck um where what i don't get involved with is i don't feel that i have a role in, in anything to do with helping them move on, um, you know, and go towards the light and free themselves. I, I don't think that's my job at all. Um, I'm frankly couldn't care less as to why they're there. I'm curious, I don't mean to be like cold hearted, but I think there's a plan in place on the other side. Um, I'm just curious as to how technology is catching up now and how we were able to, to actually document and evidence that uh, that they're in a in a given location. So I've seen a lot of things, a lot of very strange things, and there's really no doubt to me that that this is there's no simple explanation. And I call it paranormal or supernatural, but to me, I've seen enough evidence there is something going on. And sometimes these spirits are able to manipulate physical physical objects. They're able to speak audibly, sometimes through, um, you know, tape recorders, videos. Sometimes you can see visual apparitions. And, um, you know, most most of everything you experience has an explanation, but every now and then, uh, you know, you'll, you'll catch evidence of this. Okay, let's um, talk about how you um, find out if videos and photographs are fake i guess we'll start with um photographs so when it comes to faking things let me make it clear i fully believe there is such a thing as karma if you do something bad or try to do something to screw people over karma will come back to bite you and that's the reason why uh it is shown that whenever someone tries to fake a video or or something and they're doing it on purpose then karma will come back to bite them it's going to get uh revealed that they were trying to fake something and if you 
subscribe to that idea, well, then you would think it's got to be a piece of cake to find out if a photograph truly is fake because karma will make sure the photograph is shown to be a fake. Um, I know I'm <laughs> jumping off into the deep end there, but um, in regards to uh, different types of photographs that you are that's specific to your work and how you would determine if they're fake or not fake, uh, tell us all about that. Yeah, well, that's kind of my 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 primary um, work the moment you know what we did on on the show factor faked um the i still get a lot of people every week sending me photos and then um my friendly spiegel over at the huffington post will send me mostly videos uh to analyze and um i don't it, it is becoming more and more difficult one of my first clues is is a witness who's open to answering questions the the internet makes it a lot easier for people just to hide behind an anonymity, you know, and, and to not answer any questions whatsoever. And it's actually kind of hard to track down the original posters of, of some videos. Um, so when you do finally get a hold of someone, though, are they willing to answer questions? And if you can interview them in person, you know, I always say, if you can't figure out the story, figure out the storyteller. Because most people are not very good liars. If they if they present a good video and they use good CGI, there's really only so far you can get. You could either say yes, that's really good CGI, uh, or it's real. So it, it you know kind of leaves you with without anywhere else to go unless you actually talk to the person. And so what we do is first try to fit, focus on the video, take the shortcut. All right, without talking to the person, what do I see? Are there red flags as far as um, you, you don't have to have a great knowledge of, you know, animation and editing to, to kind of pull apart some things that look like they're out of place. And, and if that doesn't work, then, you know, I, I always like to try and interview the, the person themselves. Where did you take this video? What were you doing? Why is there only 30 seconds of it? Why does it end right here? What happened after you turned off the camera? Can you send me the raw video? You know, and if they're reluctant to do that, and you look at the metadata of a photo or video, and it says it's been edited, and they won't give you the raw video, you have to ask yourself why. If they really are, you know, trying to um, be cooperative, then then why don't we have it? And I would say 95% of these cases that are even really good, they fall apart when you get to that stage. So unfortunately there's, there's a lot of that going on. Oh yeah, no question. I mean, sometimes uh, it's so obvious. Uh, one notable example, not that this would tie into the work you do, but Anderson Cooper of CNN said he was at Sandy Hook and then he moved his head to the side and the front of his nose disappeared. Dead giveaway. He was standing in front of a screen to fake the, uh, his appearance at, at Sandy Hook, but um, I'm digressing. Moving on, uh, let's, let's get back to uh, night vision technology for a moment, because um, why the color green? I, you look through night vision, it seems like green is the color people would would think of um, at, when you look through night vision. What is it about that color when it comes to night vision technology? Well, uh you know, that's, I, I believe the original night vision was black and white. Then they went to green because the eye is more sensitive to to the color and different shades of it. But now they've kind of gone back to black and white. The latest technology is, is a phosphorus black and white tube. Um, so I've heard both things, but that the phosphorus the black and white is actually easier on the eyes. And supposedly now they are saying that you can detect more shades a black and white rather than green. So what it is is it's the gases that are used um, in the tubes, and that's why it comes out green. Um, there are a couple companies like FLIR. I know I've seen prototypes of colored night vision, and once they come out with that, hopefully we'll start to get more and more to the point where it's just like daytime. Um, the problem is, you know, of course, at night you're losing a lot of the the daytime light spectrum and and that's how we get the reflections of um of all the different colors so it's a process of putting those colors back in with the available light and and I think we're getting there but but for now yeah that's that's why they uh green is the predominant one but we're also going to see more more black and white and it kind of feels like we're going back in time <laughs> 
you know, but, but until the color night vision comes out and it's, it's, you know, really accurate, then this is what we we use. Okay. So l- let's say hypothetically you're using a night vision technology to find a UFO in the sky. Um, you see something using the night vision and then you um, take away the night vision to see if you can see this with the naked eye. Um, well, well, first of all, uh, clarify me, is there binocular um, tech, um, stuff involved with night vision to make things move, move closer or appear closer? Uh, to appear closer? Well, a lot of our scopes do use, I mean, you have a magnification lens. Um, but but the, the best way to film for now is not digitally. It, it's the old analog way where we'll take like a, an iPhone or a video camera and connect it to the eyepiece and film through that. So if you wanted to see something closer, you could zoom in in that way or, you know, take it in, in post-production and zoom in. But um, what you're seeing is basically in, in military grade night vision is light enhanced to up to 50,000 times. So, you are looking at a portion of the infrared spectrum, but you're seeing light amplified 50,000 times. So there are some things, some parts of the IR spectrum you can't see with your naked eye that you'll see through night vision. We're also experimenting with thermal cameras because that does see a longer wavelength of the IR spectrum that you, you obviously can't see. Um, it's not just enhancement. It's, it's, it's actually seeing that portion of the spectrum and I have recorded uh, triangles. I recorded a triangle once that I couldn't see uh, without the thermal camera, but yet there it was um, silently, you know, coming over a mountain ridge uh, in the thermal. Okay, so hypothetically, if a UFO tried to be to go invisible, um, well, there's many different theories. That, well, not not many, but some theories as to how exactly you can make something appear invisible. There's more than one way to do it. So um, in regards to using night vision technology to uncover invisible things, uh, how would that work? How does it work? And is it possible that maybe some invisibility technologies are so good that night vision will not detect the uh, the object? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, night vision, like I said, when, when you say night vision, we're generally talking about light amplification of, and, and some of it is within the IR spectrum, but, but, um, You'll you'll be able to see a lot of these satellite type objects, same size and distance as a satellite, and and the very fact that you're using night vision, uh, you'll be able to see a whole lot more of these objects doing strange maneuvers than without it. So it's not uncovering it; it's just making it easier to see. Now, when it comes to things that might be you know using a cloaking technology, the thermal, um, like in the case that I believe I filmed it can um, show that object through detecting its heat signature. So if the object is giving off heat, it'll still show up with a defined shape. Um, and, you know, there, there are some other theories of how, how things are you know, being hidden. So we're also experimenting with what we call full-spectrum cameras. They're using ghost hunting, but uh, the idea is not only to look into the infrared, but also look into the ultraviolet. So if there's light reflecting off of it in any of the that portion of the spectrum. So we're we're looking at a lot more uh different options to to see things and and uh it's anyone's guess as to, to how this is you know works with the technology and what's being used. Okay, uh thank you. Okay, I'm off mute now. Um all right, one uh, thing that I'd like to discuss, I uh, don't know if this ties too much into your work, uh, it has been said the NSA does have technology that Edward Snowden has not yet released, but other people have, uh, other whistleblowers that nobody listens to, saying that the one NSA form of technology is that they can track and monitor people because just like every single a person has their own uh, fingerprint, unique fingerprint, so too does everybody have their own unique bodily heat and light emission spectrum. And if the NSA can uh, fingerprint that spectrum, then they can using their technology and also using the alleged Gwen Towers um, track people. Uh, since you mentioned um, heat signatures earlier, I feel the need to bring this up. Could you, um, even if you haven't researched this, could you perhaps uh, give some theories on how the NSA might have the technology to do that, tracking us through our light and heat emissions? 
Um, I, yeah, you're right. I wouldn't have any way of, of, of guessing as to, to, to what that is. I may have heard something about that before, you know, just by reading it in newspaper or something, but no, I don't, um, I don't know. I, I really, I, I don't know of a unique heat signature that we, we give off like that. And, um, the, when we give off heat signature too, it's given off optically. So, so it's basically you're, you're, you're pointing a camera at a person. So, you know, tracking somebody through that, it's not like we have a radio beacon inside of us. You, it, it has to be picked up by some type of a lens of some sort. And, and I, I sell the, the latest and greatest of, of what's issued, you know, to our military. So it's if it were a technology that's far beyond that, then then I wouldn't know about it. But there's nothing that you know that uh, you take two separate people. Someone might be giving off a little bit more heat than another person. You know, you can you can take a thermal camera look at somebody's hands, and um, females typically have a lot more you know l- less circulation, so they'll have colder hands and and feet. And you can see that, but that changes within an individual as well. So I'd be very interested if that technology does exist, how is it working? Because with what's out there generally, um, there's there's not a way of doing that. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, how many more minutes do you want to go, by the way? Because I did want to ask you maybe a couple questions about your work as a uh, FBI special agent. But um, how much more time are you willing to go? Well, it's not <laughs> willing. I'd love to chat longer. I, I like I mentioned at the top of the show. I was just on the phone with um, the the web host who's got my website, and uh, I re- <laughs> need to get this back up and running because if anyone's interested, nightvisionops.com. Just jot it down, but come back to the website, and hopefully a couple days we'll have this resolved. Um, but yeah, I've got to get back onto that right now. So. Um, All right, we so you want, we could uh, definitely do this at a later time. Okay. Um, I guess I'll give you another um, half-hour show to cover um, this, uh, that FBI stuff and also a few other things. So uh, as far as um, any specific days, I'm not going to be able to do it um, on Friday or Saturday, but either tomorrow, as a matter of fact, or um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of next week, I can give you half an hour sometime after 6 p.m. Uh, any time work for you? Any day? Um, I'm actually, yeah, you you are actually the last interview I have until at least uh, July. Yeah, because I'm, I'm all booked out and I've I've got um, conventions. I'm going to be in Australia for a month and getting married and moving. And <laughs> so I I don't have any more time for interviews until then. But uh, if you, yeah, shoot me an email and we'll, we'll try and work something out later. And uh, so what month do you want me to uh, send you that email? At the beginning of July uh, or that work? Yeah, beginning of July would be great. All right, I will do that. So I guess I'll be doing the rest of the show myself for about an hour or so. So uh, take care, Ben. Good luck with your work, and I hope to see you in the uh, very near future again on the show. Thanks so much. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, folks, you're going to be listening to me for a little bit, but if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I need to uh, get that article that I was going to um, talk about on my show. Taking a little while here to load the page, but all right, here it is. So, this article is called Unidentified Flying Objects The Reality, The Cover Up, and The Truth. Just want to talk about this, folks, because I can't see myself doing a radio show for only half an hour. It's not uh, not like me. I've got to go at least an hour uh, every show. Um, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, folks, this is really a pain in the ass. Mozilla Firefox, for some reason, a lot of ads pop up. I have software installed on my computer and yet for some inexplicable reason all these ads and messages the security system and the virus protection is not stopping it I'm not going to speculate on what's going on but this article is by this individual named uh, John Black so I will just read the article and give my two cents in as I go along 
And um, I'm probably not going to be able to um, talk in the chat room while I'm doing this. I may try, but it's just when I'm hosting the show myself, it's not as easy. But without further ado, John Black's article about UFOs, unidentified flying objects or UFOs as they are commonly known, have been witnessed by millions of people all over the world and have been recorded in history books, myths, legends, and traditions for thousands of years. However, many accounts that are recorded in ancient texts are dismissed as mere myths and legends, while UFO sightings that have taken place in the last few centuries have been classified as misinterpretations of natural phenomenon, illusion, or conspiracy theories. Yes, the word conspiracy theories was coined by the phrase was coined by the CIA to discredit anyone who comes up with conspiracy theories. And that doesn't make sense. Not supposed to. History has shown us time and time again that a plethora of so called myths have their basis in reality. Yes, as um it is said that myths and legends are based on truth, but folk tales are not. Folk tales are accepted to be fictional by the people that tell them, but myths and legends are accepted to have some grain of truth to them. But uh, it says here it is possible and indeed likely that stories and legends were a way for people to explain real and perhaps perplexing events using the knowledge and beliefs of their time. In support of this theory, a number of events described in mythology, which were once considered mere fairy tales, have now been proven through archaeology to have existed. A famous example is the city of Troy, which is central to Homer's The Iliad, long considered to be a city of myth. Henrich Schliemann's discovery of the actual site in 1868 elevated it to a place in history. Hmm. How do you know for a fact that it was Troy? I point that out because there's um, one example I like to use to talk about my point here is the Big Bang thing where those people, Arneo Penzias and Robert Wilson at Princeton Labs, claim to have discovered cosmic microwave background radiation. And it was said that that was evidence or proof, more specifically it was said, of the Big Bang being real. But none of the sources out there offer a shred of evidence that that cosmic microwave background radiation was part of a Big Bang, or evidence of a Big Bang. They basically just say, okay, this is what it is, that's the way it's going to be, you act like that's what it is, that it's evidence for a Big Bang, and if you don't, then you're a crackpot. Um, and that's the way it's been ever since. So this whole thing about the city of Troy being discovered by Schliemann, was it really Troy? I am not really an expert on this subject on, in terms of researching um, any sign that it was a fraudulent story, but... Um, I'm certainly open to the possibility that maybe it's not what Schliemann and other people thought it was. But moving on, the remainder of the Iliad, however, is still viewed as a myth and fantasy without any serious attempts being made to investigate whether or not there may be more truth behind the tale. The same goes for many accounts of flying machines, which we find reference to in countless mythologies for numerous different cultures uh, around the world. And there's some pictures they show here from ancient Sumeria of... Um, Flying machines, which Zachariah Sitchin talked about, belong to the uh, the Anunnaki. Uh, it says here in the sub um, in the um, sub thing here below the video, many cultures contain pictorial and written records of flying machines. Yet these are usually dismissed as myths and legend. Well, many people, including George Norrie, said the ancients depicted what they saw. Uh, I mean, is it possible that they some things they thought were fiction they would have thought was worthwhile putting on? Cave walls and such, I suppose so, but in general, it is accepted among um, those in the uh, mainstream and truth movements that the ancients depicted what they saw. Um, but it says here, it is common to see people selectively decide what is real and what is not, like I was saying, and all of this on the unsubstantiated assumption that ancient people were primitive and had little to no knowledge compared to us today. On the contrary, many ancient civilizations like the Sumerians, Indus Valley, and Egyptians existed with complex social structures, legal systems, art, astronomy, mathematics, and technology, some of which is still not fully understood today. The Antikythera mechanism, for example, is a 2,200-year-old mechanical device that is still not completely understood despite uh, decades of research by top scientists around the world. Yeah, I do remember um, David Hatcher Childress saying that um, that Antikythera mechanism, which was found in the waters of the Mediterranean, um, was tantamount to finding a jet airplane in the tomb of King Tut. Um, although I have, have heard some theories that Archimedes invented the Antikythera mechanism. Those people who believe that say, keep the aliens out of it. Let's try to think humans can can invent these things. But regardless of whether or not humans did actually make them with or without extraterrestrial technology, there is definitely evidence that ETs were here on planet Earth. 
this um, subcaption here says, um, subtitle, excuse me, in the main article set titled Ancient Astronaut Theory. Moving on, um, the topic of flying objects and supernatural beings from out of our world is one in which we find multiple references and mythologies. All of these myths and legends, along with archaeological evidence such as rock art depictions, have created a wave of theories that give birth to ancient astronaut perspective, which links all these ancient references and depictions to UFOs and um, posits that extraterrestrials visited Earth and made contact with humans in antiquity and prehistory, influencing the development of human cultures, technologies, and religions. Unfortunately, there are numerous charlatans who have tried to cash in on this movement for profit and publicity or have dismissed it with caricatures of little green men resulting in the ancient astronaut perspective being widely criticized and attacked for its lack of credibility. They say it's for profit or publicity. How would anyone do that? I mean, many people say if you talk about crazy things like aliens and UFOs, you are not going to be able to make much money in life. That's the way the Matrix works. But um, now it's saying your people will try to take advantage of this to cash in on, on a profit or publicity. And those powers that be, I, I often talk about in my show, are going to great lengths to discredit Zachariah Sitchin. Um, Michael Heiser, who's a prominent Sitchin skeptic, I did send him an email message back in the day uh, to ask him what he thought about um, those theories that Zachariah Sitchin was a disinfo agent who worked for the CIA and Illuminati. And also David Icke um, in his uh, Revelations of Mother, Mother Goddess documentary when Arizona Wilder told him that Sitchin was a reptilian alien disinformer, literally a reptilian alien. And as I've explained on my previous shows, Andrew Bartz has told me that's not true. Those uh, people who said that were forced on an alternate timeline against them, their will, which made them think Sitchin was a fraud. And, uh, well, I didn't get into that with Heiser, but I did tell him about what he what he thought about the statement that Sitchin was a disinfo agent. And Heiser said, it's too anecdotal for me to take seriously. I think Sitchin was just doing it for the money. <laughs> Pretty close-minded answer, if you ask me. But uh, I'd like to get get on with this article. Uh, consequently, what is in fact a plausible and possible explanation for what we see in ancient arts and texts is now rarely examined by scholars who fear being ridiculed or have their professional career uh, seriously undermined. Yeah, I was just making that point, coincidentally. They're showing that picture here, a uh, picture here of uh, um, UFOs in art, um, Battissimo di Cristo, 1710. This uh, was painted. It's in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge showing a uh, UFO shooting uh, four beams of light down in what appears to show some cloak-like being that's bright and some person apparently bowing down or kneeling to that figure. And uh, there's lots of people watching this. Uh, I've seen this picture on um, Ancient Aliens before. Um, make this picture whatever you will, but uh, I guess the people that drew this picture, it's kind of strange that they would include that in a 1710 painting because uh, there weren't flying machines back in those days, they say. Well, apparently not because there's a UFO in this painting. Uh, UFO sightings in recent history. But let's leave the ancient past for a while and examine just the last 80 years of human history. Millions of people all over the globe have witnessed unidentified flying objects. Many have been recorded in detailed reports witnessed by police, pilots, astronauts, government officials, pilots, uh, military personnel, and, of course, ordinary citizens. Uh, some of the more well-known cases were witnessed by thousands of people at one time. Historical records make it um, evident that UFO appearances magnified during and after World War II, including the example of the famous Foo Fighters. Hmm. That seems kind of counterintuitive. Didn't Stan Freeman say, wouldn't they use it in the wars? Uh, well, we explained why they didn't use them in the wars uh, not that long ago when I was had Ben Hansen on the show uh, earlier. Uh, so um, the Foo Fighters, that was a notable exception. Uh Next um, paragraph here. While most sightings can be explained either by celestial phenomena, airplanes, planets, weather, phenomena, military exercises, or in some cases drug use or mental instability, there still exists a small percentage that cannot be accounted for by any of these explanations. This is what makes the phenomena important and not to be ignored, particularly considering that sightings are frequently reported around military bases and airfields and are therefore at the very least a matter of both national security and air safety. Ooh, I shudder when I hear national security and safety because I've often said, like many others who know what's going on, that it's all a scam. Tell us, we've got to take your rights for national security. We've got to take your rights for safety. It's all a scam to make up you give up your rights so they can control you. Don't fall into the scam, the scam folks, and make sure the sheeple don't either. But anyway, I'm digressing. This is supposed to be at UFOs, not giving up liberty for security. Uh, it is an undeniable fact that there are cases of unidentified objects in our skies. It has been acknowledged by the major governments from all over the world, simply through the very fact that official research 
has been conducted on the matter in the U.S., U.K., Russia, Europe, China, South America, and many others. All of this research in every single case concluded that there is a percentage of phenomena that cannot be explained. In the past decade, many countries have declassified their UFO research uh, files, releasing thousands of documents through the Freedom of Information Act and making numerous UFO cases available in the public domain. One recently released document from the UFO files in Britain revealed how Winston Churchill, concerned about the UFO issue, ordered a shutdown of information for at least 50 years to prevent mass panic and the potential to undermine religious beliefs. Um, I wonder if it was really about that, considering Churchill was a notorious Rothschild asset. Um, make of that whatever you will in regards to its connections to the UFO issue, but uh, I wonder if that had anything to do with uh, mass panic pre prevention and potential to undermine religious beliefs was the real reason that the, he and his Rothschild masters would want to uh, order a shutdown of information. But anyway, I'm digressing. Moving on, the document in question was also published on the BBC News site in 2010, those um, Freedom of Information Act documents. Uh, by doing careful research on the topic, passing over obvious scams and fake stories, it is clear to see that unidentified flying objects do exist. So the question is not whether they exist or not, but rather what they are. Are they of terrestrial or extraterrestrial origin, and what is their purpose? Next uh, subchapter in this article, titled UFOs and the Limits of Science. Many prominent scientists have already stated that other civilizations must exist in the universe and that it would be statistically impossible for this not to be the case. Yes, it is statistically impossible by the laws of probability. However, with our knowledge of science and technology, we cannot yet support the means for interstellar travel. Um, yeah, right. Uh, the um, government is hiding technology, which is extraterrestrial connected. Um, but um, for the purposes of this article, they weren't going to say that. So um, I just thought I'd point that out. But um, and since we have not yet discovered intelligent life in our solar system, <laughs> bull crap. Uh, my interviews with Alfred Weber and Andrew Bishago talked about the and John Lear too, the uh, creatures that are on Mars. So um, and as John Lear talked about, every planet has life because every planet has its own filtering system, which allows for life to exist regardless of the planet's size or or location. Um, and I guess that's how the Anunnaki can survive on Nibiru, as I've said many times in my in my shows, even though Nibiru is in a 3,600-year elliptical orbit. But, um, yeah, this article is just um, trying to act like mainstream science, even though it's not really a mainstream science article. It says here, the assumption is made that there must be no way that ETs could have traveled to Earth. However, this argument is, of course, flawed. Uh, now it's not becoming mainstream science-like, uh, because it is based within the framework of our own understanding of the universe and does not take into account the capabilities of civilizations that may be millions of years ahead of our own. It also hinges on the following assumptions. We know everything about physics and reality, and therefore there is uh, no way that such distant travel can be achieved. Yeah, right. Uh, we're using our means to try to contact other civilizations, such as SETI's attempt to pick up radio or communication signals. SETI, as Stan Freeman says, is a silly effort to investigate. It's a joke. And since we don't perceive any signals of our type, nothing must exist. <laughs> yeah, why it's a silly effort to investigate. We are looking for organic forms of life exactly like us and for planets with the exact same conditions as ours. Well, as I said, John Lear said that. And also, George Cavazzo says John Lear was right about that um, planetary filtering system thing. <coughs> Excuse me, folks, I need a drink. It says here, it is clear that these arguments show that aggregates of mankind... Uh, mankind that may just be an infant in the universe, and this is not new. During the history of humanity, in every single period of time, we believe that we knew the truth, only to have it replaced later by new knowledge. There is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Lord Kelvin, 1901, uh, the physicist said that uh, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lord Kelvin, for that. I'm stating the obvious there. Next uh, paragraph says, quantum physics, still a relatively new and unexplored field in science, has shown that reality could be completely different than what we believe it to be. Powerful telescopes have shown distant planets and solar systems that could sustain life. Uh, theories of wormholes and warp drives have shown that at a theoretical level, we could achieve interstellar travel. Yes, we would require incredible amounts of energy to even think of trying to achieve something like this. So according to our standards today, it is impossible to achieve, but in theory, it can be achieved and is being achieved by the uh, secret technology that's kept out of the public arena, most certainly. I added that part. Uh, uh, here's a quote here by Carl Sagan, the late professor of astronomy and space sciences at Cornell University. 
He says, quote, it now seems quite clear that Earth is not the only inhabited planet. There is evidence that the bulk of the, of the stars in the sky have planetary systems. Recent research concerning the origins of life on Earth suggests that the physical and chemical processes leading to the origin of life occur rapidly in the early history of Earth. Um, excuse me, uh, l- let me start over. Recent research concerning the origin of life on Earth suggests that the physical and chemical processes leading to the origin of life occur rapidly in the early history of the majority of planets within our Milky Way galaxy. Perhaps as many as a million are inhabited by technical civilizations in advance of our own. Interstellar space flight is far beyond our present technical capabilities, uh, but there seems to be no fundamental physical objections to preclude from our own vantage point the possibility of its development by other civilizations, unquote. Carl Sagan, as I said, said that. He knew a lot more than what he was talking about, Carl Sagan did, but he wouldn't talk about it uh, for whatever the reason may be. Next, a subchapter, reluctance to engage with the UFO subject. Oh, didn't I just say that Carl Sagan might have been like that? Uh, the reason that the scientific community is not dealing seriously with UFOs is because the topic has been extensively ridiculed, both by the media and in academic circles, with false information spread everywhere. For similar reasons, military personnel, astronauts, pilots, and other categories of professionals do not want to talk because either they have been forced to see uh, to, to sign confidentiality, gra- confidentiality agreements or because of fear that their careers would be destroyed. This is why we have seen examples. This is why we have seen um, many deathbed confessions. Um, well, they can make all the deathbed confessions they want. Uh, many people still will not believe those deathbed confessions, sadly, because some people can't handle the truth. Let's wake those people up. All right, let's moving on here. One such case uh, was the astronaut Gordon Cooper, who told the world about his experiences encountering a UFO during his flight in the Mercury capsule in 1963. Before he died, he stated, "For many years, I have lived with a secret, uh, lived with a secret and a secrecy imposed on all specialists in aeronautics. It can now reveal that every day in the USA, our radar instruments capture objects of form and com- composition unknown to us." But great efforts have been made to ridicule and disparage anyone who lends support to the existence of UFOs. The fact remains that there are numerous high-profile cases that are supported by solid evidence and which should not be dismissed. Recorded UFO sightings with extensive witness support is the next uh, sub uh, subtitle here. Below, I present a very limited list uh, constituting strong evidence for the existence of unidentified flying objects in the last 60 years. I'm not going to get too much um, into this uh, I'll just briefly summarize what these events were. This event, uh, November 1942, L.A. incident known as the Battle of Los Angeles, which happened in the early hours of February 25th in 1942. Uh, the military saw some sort of a UFO craft. They bombarded it with uh, with uh, shells and artillery and uh, didn't seem to uh, do anything to the UFO. There was Because uh, the UFO didn't come down falling from the sky and all that. And uh, the L.A. Times uh, wrote a story about it and... Uh, the government itself stated that the craft they were shooting was unidentified. Uh, and that was the Battle of Los Angeles. And then there's the uh, n- December 1980 Rendlesham Forest incident. You know what? I don't think I really need to get into detail on this. If anybody wants to hear an expert talk about it, check out my interview with Linda Moulton Howe. This was in the um, second half of the interview. I don't remember the exact time period. Um, but again, it was in the second hour. If anybody wants to learn all about the Rendlesham Forest incident, um that happened in December 1980 in Suffolk, UK, not too far from a uh, from a military base. When they went into the forest and saw a UFO, and then uh, one of the witnesses there was implanted with some sort of a binary code. Uh, Linda does uh, clarify a few things on about that because some people have confused that issue with the whole high Brazil thing, and because of ancient aliens, and she clears that up. So, if you want to learn about that? Check out my interview with Linda Moulton Howe. The uh, Next UFO sighting, the November uh, 1986 Japan Airlines uh, flight 1628 over Alaska. Um, This was, uh, there's actually a picture here that shows the UFO is enormous. The plane uh, is really, really small compared to the UFO. You could probably put uh, uh, Boeing jumbo jets, like maybe uh, looking at this picture here, I'd say about maybe eight Boeing jumbo jets across the diameter of this UFO and maybe six jumbo jets top to bottom, the the vertical uh, diameter of this UFO. It was big, and many people saw this. Um, it says UFOs in this case were tracked on both ground and airborne radar, witnessed by experienced airline pilots, and confirmed by FAA Division Chief. Yes, a lot of bad things happen to pilots who say they see UFOs, but uh, many people saw this, and uh, 
therefore it was kind of hard not to hide. So I guess if everybody on a plane is talking about how they saw a UFO and saying, talk to the pilot, he'll say he saw it. Well, then they really can't do anything to the pilot if he says that he saw a UFO because everybody's backing him up and supporting him, everybody that was on board the plane. So they're not going to do anything to those pilots. But pilots should just come out on their own and say, I saw a UFO. Bad things happen to them. There was an episode on the recent series, Hangar One, where my previous guest, John Ventry, was a made frequent, frequent appearances on that History Channel uh, show, Hangar One, the UFO uh, files. So I rec- about what happens to pilots and pilots who saw um, UFOs. You guys might want to watch that. You'll probably be able to find it on YouTube. Um, next article is the April uh, 1990 UF, uh, the Belgian UFO wave. Oh, we did actually talk about this uh, in my interview with Lynn Kitai uh, last week. Uh, she talked about the Phoenix Lights, but some of the Phoenix lights that were over the, uh, which is actually the next cell looking down here. I don't think I need to go over this. So if anybody wants to um, learn about the Phoenix lights that happened in March, 1997 in Arizona, and also the uh, Belgian UFO wave that happened in April, uh, 1990 with uh, triangular shaped UFOs with lights, uh, just like the uh, Phoenix lights uh, UFOs. People think there was some connection by all means, check that out. And by the way, uh, just as an addendum to Lynn's interview, I did uh, post a message on Lynn's Facebook uh page um because she mentioned that um many people were trying to see the hell bob comet um at the same time that the um phoenix lights happened and instead of seeing hell bob they saw the phoenix lights grab their attention and uh alex collier et contactee said that the phoenix lights were excuse me said that the uh hell bob comet was actually a ufo bios uh, an extraterrestrial biosphere um artificial craft masquerading as a comet which was, and it was really UFO extraterrestrial um, biosphere, and a biosphere is another name for an artificial planet or moon construct that ETs live on. And I can't help but wonder if Hellbop was an aircraft carrier of sorts, and those uh, UFOs that you saw over uh, Phoenix um, and the surrounding area in March 1987 originally came from Hellbop. Lynn told me he actually gave a response that said, "That's a very interesting idea, but." Um, I don't think she's going to look into it. She is a healthy skeptic, so the idea that comets are masquerading as biospheres is probably not something that she would go into considering that she's a very healthy skeptic, she says. But I thought I'd throw it out. So um, listen to my interview here if you want to learn about that. Then there's the October 2004, the Osaka airport um, in Japan, that UFO sighting. Um, several people reported on Twitter that they saw groups of lights forming a triangular shape and flashing green, red, and white in the night sky over um, Izumi City in Osaka um, Prefecture. The sighting caused a commotion on Twitter, and uh, yes, a lot of people definitely saw this one. So um, that's what, the more people that see a UFO, the less crazy you're going to be if you talk about it. I mentioned that earlier in case of pilots. It's also true, of course, with the uh, general public. So, um, But whether or not you see a UFO in your life, uh, Well, if you haven't seen one, don't feel bad if you haven't, because a lot of people haven't, too. And I don't believe I've actually uh, seen a true UFO in my my life. But uh, if you do see a UFO, try to get one on – try to get it on camera and by all means put on YouTube. Next is the November 2006 O'Hare Airport in uh, Chicago. Um, Yes, this was a metallic uh, flying saucer-shaped craft hovering over gate C-17. And lots and lots of people saw it. Pilots and employees, and uh, and many all the people at the airport. They saw the um, the uh, the disc was visible for approximately two minutes, and was seen by close to a dozen United Airlines employees, ranging from pilots to supervisors, who heard chatter on the radio and raced out to to view it. And I believe this um, craft uh, did actually shoot up into the sky and cause like a a hole in the clouds. There was a um, UFO hunters episode on this. Uh, Specific craft, I believe. I don't remember. If I discussed it with with Bill Burns when I interviewed him, but uh, that was a good interview with Bill Burns. By the way, I definitely recommend checking it out. And um, and uh, this UFO did leave its mark, a hole, uh, hole in the clouds, and everybody saw that. All right, next article: the uh, May 2007 UFO fleets in Lima, Peru. In May 2007, at 1400 local time in Lima. Moving lights resembling an armada, flying ships appeared in the sky. The story was reported on the news and was seen by thousands of of people. Yeah, I wonder if this was um, similar to what people saw in the. Um, there's that painting of uh, 
UFOs in the sky. This is, I don't remember what century this was, like the 15th or the 16th century. Maybe it was the 17th century. Lots of people saw UFOs in the sky, saw some crashing down as if there was a battle going on. And, uh, well, this wasn't a battle, but it, I'm, what I'm trying to make is the whole idea of many UFOs being seen at once and then eventually disappearing um, after um, briefly moving around or briefly fighting, whatever they're doing is nothing new. Lots of UFOs at once appearing and then disappearing, as uh, such was the case here. There's also this July 2010 uh, Xiaoshan Airport in China at uh, this identif- unidentified flying object uh, uh, disrupted air traffic in uh, Hongshu for an hour and Wednesday, the 10th of July, 2010, um, the flight crew preparing for descent first detected the object around 8.40 p.m. and noticed air traffic control to, and notified air traffic control. And um, aviation authorities responded within minutes, and uh, it was confirmed to ABC News that the matter is under investigation, and uh, no further details were exposed. Um, uh, they said uh, an anonymous source told China Daily that authorities already discovered the identity of the UFO after an investigation, but could not publicly disclose the information because there was a military connection. Quote, there was a military connection. Uh, okay, an anonymous source told them that. Oh, it says the source is anonymous. We can't trust them, all the skeptics and sheeple would say. Yes, uh, we don't want that. Now, do we wake up, sheeple? We need you to wake up. We don't want you to be asleep. If an anonymous source says something that's of significance, have some heart to maybe believe that the anonymous source is telling the truth. Next thing here, disclosure. Want to learn about ET disclosure? Check out my interview with Steve Bassett. We talk all about that. And also my roundtable discussion, which Elizabeth Mulligan, Elizabeth Diamond Mulligan, was uh, the main host of that. I was just a second-rate host in that roundtable discussion. Check that out, too, by all means. But anyway, in regards to disclosure, many would say that the above examples constitute irrefutable proof that ET UFOs exist. So why isn't the public told about it? Uh, the implications would mean a lot. Acknowledgement of ET civilizations having visited Earth would mean myths and legends of the past are true to a great extent. It would say humanity has been influenced for millennia by otherworldly beings, that um, beings in the past were considered gods, as Eric von Daniken talked about. Disclosure would topple the status quo and the balance of powers and turn everything upside down. The acknowledgement of UFO phenomena is an event that with the power to bring a global revolution in every sector of our lives today, technology and energy supply, communication and environmental concerns, society and religion, yeah, that would all change. Uh, is this what governments and corporations are afraid of, a shift in balance and their loss of their positions of power and control? Or is it the power, the powers that be are afraid of rewriting our human history? Well, that's the end of the article. I guess I'm going to call this a show after I just give my final two cents in on this. When I had Linda Moulton Howe and Stephen Bassett on my show, they both talked about, no, all that stuff about society would crumble, everything will change. I believe that that's, that, that's just the excuse everybody gives to uh, say that this is why ETs can't be exposed. But in reality, that's not the real reason. That, the, the whole idea that they can't handle the truth, humanity can't handle the truth, is a, it's just a, a psyop and a cover story. It's just that they don't want this stuff being exposed because um, – it would um, keep the powers that be from uh, controlling us with technology and such, and would rewrite our human history that they that they impose lies upon us. And um, uh, here's one final quote. I didn't get to this. By Dr. J. Allen Hynek, scientific advisor to the Air Force, says, "Quote: When the long-awaited solution to the UFO problem comes, I believe that it will prove to be not merely the next small step in the march of science, but a mighty and totally unexpected quantum leap." Yes, and um, some people have always referenced the uh, War of the Worlds. Uh, a thing with um, Orson Welles, the radio show broadcast, saying the Martians are coming, and over a million people believe what they heard, and there was chaos in the streets, and that's proof people say that humans can't handle the truth if they saw UFOs and ETs. Well, Stephen Bassett told me that was then, this is now. It's People will will be able to handle it, and in my interview with Ray Kusalandich, he said the ETs will, in the not-too-distant future, I'm not going to give any time periods because time is an illusion, said that the ETs will show themselves and the people will be able to handle it. They're not going to go nuts. It's not going to be like that. It's not like those War of the Worlds radio show broadcast days. Well, I do hope that's the case. <sighs> well, folks, I only got an hour show time today, but I hope you uh, got the most of this. The sun's still out. I guess I'll go out sun gazing now. You know, I like to do that. So, um, I do hope uh, to have uh, definitely have Ben Hansen on in the uh, not too distant future, hopefully around maybe the beginning of July. And I'm not going to upload this interview to YouTube, but yet I'm just going to combine this interview with the interview with Ben Hansen. 
that second interview, I'll give him another half hour. So, so um, without further ado, I'm going to end the show now. And uh, so everybody knows Tom Clearwater, who I had on my roundtable discussion back in the day, will be coming as a solo guest this time, um, as a guest on my show um, well, for a second time, which is kind of shocking because you know I like to keep getting different guests on my show. But that was a, this is a reasonable exception because he was on a roundtable discussion for that. And uh, now I want to have him on again. So Tom Clearwater next week going to talk about human beings being a Tesla coil of all things and also ET disclosure as an addendum of sorts to this um, this show today. We're going to talk about ET disclosure because he has um, done a lot of work with that funding and such for Stephen Bassett's ET disclosure program. So um, I uh, will talk about that, probably try to pick up where Alfred Weber left off in his interview with Tom Clearwater try not to discuss too much stuff that was already discussed in that interview, although I do have no choice because then, well, the interview would be boring if I didn't talk about many things he talked about then, but um, I'll try to go where Alfred Weber didn't go. I'll pick up where he left off and talk about whole new things there. So, that's the end of this show. Namaste, everybody. This is Andrew Fisher signing off. Enjoy the rest of your check throughout Infinite Consciousness. Attention, students. As you know, it's a new school year, and dressing smart is of the utmost importance. So will all students please report to Old Navy immediately in order to get your wardrobe on flick, or flack, or whatever you kids are saying these days. Uh, class is dismissed. We run to Old Navy tomorrow for your back-to-school shopping. All kids' stuff is on sale up to 60% off, with jeans from $8 and tees from $4. That's right, all kids' stuff is up to 60% off, even uniforms. Valid 724 through 812. Select styles only. Excludes gift cards and clearance. Blog Talk Radio. Hello? Yeah, must stay, everyone. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. It is um, July 24th, 2015. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, broadcasting uh, today a special Friday episode because Ben Hansen, who is the guest on my show, uh, decided to do an extra half hour with me on the show. Um, I still don't see him in the queue here. Uh, interestingly, the uh, stream left uh, says 44. Oh, yeah, that's the show. I scheduled the show for 45 minutes. My bad. Sorry, folks, I just got to my computer. Sorry, I'm a little um, out of it at the moment. I see we have one person in the chat here, Ren White. Uh, glad to see you are there. I don't see Ben Hansen in the queue yet, but that's okay. We will first start with the news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. And by the way, uh, let me just point out Ben Hansen. He is best known for night vision technology, which is um, used to... Uh, view things in the sky that you normally cannot see with the naked eye, UFOs and such, and all the rest of it. So um, hopefully he'll call in any second now. Uh, he's probably aware that I was going to do the news first. So, but first we will, uh, like I said, start with the news. Courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. Ben, please call in. I don't see any of the queue. I hope that's not a problem. Uh, first article confirmed Tampa recruiting offices evacuated due to shooting threat. Unspecified shooting threat comes one week after Chattanooga shooting. Yeah, that whole Chattanooga shooting, there's a lot of um, controversy surrounding that shooting as to whether it was fake or uh, like staged event or whether it was actually a um, real terrorist attack uh, based on some coding things that I saw with Mr. Cat High. I watched a lot of uh, Mr. Cat Eye videos on YouTube. He does a lot of things involving codes and such, coding crop circles and and Google Doodles and all the rest of it. The Chattanooga shooting does appear to have some codes in it that suggest that it was uh, not an accident. So uh, this whole thing about uh, Tampa recruiting offices evacuated because of the shooting threat, because the Chattanooga shooting, it looks like they've fallen for the, uh, the lie, although some might say it's kind of justified because, well, the government might... Uh, stage a false flag of those recruiting offices. Let's hope not. Next article, leftist journalist. It would be funny if all grun rights people got shot dead. Uh, tells uh, detractors, I hope you die in random gunfire. Oh, that is so sick. Does this person, this leftist journalist, not understand that the Second Amendment was put in the Constitution 
by the founding fathers so we could protect ourselves from tyrants and government. Our next article is somewhat related to this ISIS terror will destroy Second Amendment. Anti-gun fantasy trounced by wide support for Second Amendment. Well, uh, it's good to see people are understanding that the Second Amendment is about stopping tyrants in government. And that's a good thing for sure. We definitely uh, need people to wake up to that fact. Uh, but ISIS, we know the U.S. government publicly runs ISIS. So uh, it's all uh, much of it is a scam in regards to what ISIS is doing. And, um, well, the whole idea that the threat of ISIS, we need to take away your right to own guns so ISIS can't get guns. It's all a scam. Don't fall for it. Next article, don't blame all Muslims for Chattanooga, but blame all conservatives for theater shooting. The uh, left sharpens its claws for gun control. Yes, the uh, and other people on the right that want to sharpen their claws for gun control. Well, I I bet there are. So uh, blame all conservatives, blame liberals, but what, whatever. It's all... Um, it's all a scam in so many ways. Next article, Obama called for gun restrictions prior to Louisiana shooting. Uh, distorts record on gun-related homicide. Yes, of course, they'll distort the record. The government lies to us so much. Although FBI crime statistics are um, are actually quite accurate, even Alex Jones has acknowledged that he's used them to, um, to do some research. And it shows that violent crime rate has gone down 49% since gun ownership went up in America since I believe it was 1991. He's talked about... Uh, next, next article, corporate media links Louisiana shooter to Tea Party, had profile page on Tea Party Nation website. Yes, it doesn't come as too much of an astonishment that they're going to try to blame the Tea Party for um, the Louisiana shooter. It's all a lie. It's all a scam. But hey, what are you going to do? That's what they want to do to disarm us. Next article, liberals call for disarming all white men after theater shooting, despite the fact that whites are responsible for just 2%, 2.5% of gun crimes in major cities like New York City. Yes, it's all a race game, too. Um, you're racist if you support guns. You're racist if you don't support guns. It's all designed to brainwash us. It doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to. One last article here. Apparently, this is maybe the only article here, not about gun, gun rights and shootings and such. Uh, Planned Parenthood expects undercover reporters to release video of clinics harvesting baby organs. Disgusted journalists were shown a highly sensitive area in a clinic where tissue is processed. Well, you know my uh, attitude towards abortion. I am indifferent towards abortion. I'm not pro-abortion, but yet I'm not anti-abortion. I'm indifferent towards it. I'm not going to hold anything against a woman if she gets one, although I will, will make it very clear. I would definitely take adoption over abortion any day. Infowars is anti-abortion in many ways, so they'll kind of beg to differ with me on that one. But, um, you know, the Planned Parenthood, they were created by the powers that be to um, depopulate the earth and keep population low. And uh, it's not so strange that the clinic would harvest baby organs. It's disgusting, but that's kind of the way it is. So, but anyway... Here is, uh, by the way, I just want to acknowledge uh, Re Ren Wright, see in the chat room, I want to acknowledge you there. You're the only person there, so <laughs> don't know if we could have much of a of a conversation here, but I believe this is Ben Hansen in the queue. Uh, area code uh, 714, is this Ben Hansen? Hey, how's it going, Andrew? Hey, uh, welcome back to the show. Glad to have you on. I'd like, first of all, I'd like to apologize for me. I already did in that email, but just want to publicly apologize that for making it seem like yesterday would be available. I, I didn't take care to notice that email where you said you're going to be on the road, and I wasn't aware that I would myself would be working late that night. So there was no way you could get a show in. But we do have a show now. I do have this show uh, scheduled for as a 45-minute long, um, long episode. But we don't obviously have to go that uh, that long because you only want half an hour. So I guess we'll like end this show around 6.30, 6.45. And I pretty much talked about many of the important things in the first show, but there are some things that I missed. One thing that I would like to talk about is your career in the FBI. Just to tell everybody, what, what job did you hold in the FBI? Uh, just let me know that, and then I'll go uh, ask some questions after that. Sure. Um, well, I worked for several different agencies, uh, both public and private, and um, began when I was uh, graduated college uh, working for uh, State of Utah investigating child sex crimes. So uh, when I moved on to the federal level, that was my primary area of expertise, but I worked in um, uh, several different areas of national security and um, uh, both criminal and national security cases. So it was... Uh, it was enjoyable. I still really do love uh, working that uh, part of the public sector and may go back there, um, you know, later in my career. I don't know. The uh, the TV thing came up kind of uh, unexpectedly <laughs> and I felt like I was 
I was young enough to try, you know, different things, and um, it was an interesting transition. I'm sorry, I was on mute there. I'm I'm sure it was. So, um, why don't you uh, give us a little inside scoop on how the um, FBI goes about its uh, its its duties, its uh, forensic work, if that's the proper term for me to use in regards to the specific uh, stuff that you, the specific jobs that you had um, while you were there. Uh, let us know all about that. Uh, what do you mean, and like what aspect of it? How do they go about it? Oh, um, you. Uh, what was that thing you said about child um, thing that you did in, in regards to um, the FBI? You said you used the word child. What was that about? Uh, child sex crimes investigations. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a pretty uh, interesting subject. Many people would see it would certainly grab the attention of a news crew if they were to do like stories on that. So, I, I suppose it would uh, make sense for you to tell us. Um, uh, does the FBI have any specific protocols in regards to? how they go about child sex crimes and how they handle that um, related to other crimes, how important or unimportant it is compared to some of the other crimes that they have, um, that, that they worry about at the F well, they worry about all crimes. I'm saying is I'm sure child sex crime is one of those things that they, that they're really concerned about. So that being mm -hmm. said, um, do they uh, have any specific protocols that are special for people that, that work that kind of job? Well, the, the FBI is responsible for over 200 and, something different statutes uh, that they enforce. So before 9-11, uh, they primarily were in cr a criminal investigation agency. And then we found out that we weren't very good at domestic intelligence. You know, we didn't, we weren't able to predict, uh, you know, when crimes were going to happen. And so they got into the intelligence business. So roughly half of what the FBI does now is, um, you know, preventative measures and, and intelligence gathering like the CIA was doing internationally, but uh, we need to keep tabs on those potential problems. So there's a large portion of that. They still do um, investigate crimes of um, either magnitude, you know, the scope of it is so big that they need help because it, it goes across state lines, or there's some type of federal jurisdiction over it. So when it comes to the um, the crimes against children, um, you know, we, we investigate things that, that deal with international kidnappings, um, anything that deals with child pornography. Um, there's also, you know, federal crimes against that. So it could be uh, working with, with state uh, liaisons and enforcement. Um, but they, they also participate with, um, you know, kind of the internet chats and stuff where they, they pose as, uh, as uh, younger children and then uh, they'll come in and arrest the people and um, work a lot with ICE. Immigration and Customs also has a, a big division for um, what they call innocent images. So, um, yeah, it's it's quite satisfying to work in that field. If you're on a task force that does that, you know, exclusively, generally they have um, psychological tests that you take about every six months just to make sure that you're not being, you know, negatively affected by it. And uh, I don't know, everyone that I've seen work in it does, doesn't generally work in it for more than a few years at a time. They try and rotate them out because it's such a, you know, filthy, disgusting <laughs> type of job. I'm sure it is. And um, even though you may not have necessarily uh, worked this kind of position, there was on that recent uh uh, TV series that I know you heard about it because you were at the um, MUFON conference that uh, in Cherry Hill that I was at, where um, one of the new episodes in the in the series was about FBI um, files and um, regarding UFOs. And even though you may not have worked that, if I were to ask you to hypothesize what the FBI's stance would be on UFOs, do you have any comments or statements on that issue and how they would, uh, the, whether the FBI would even consider making it public or even not go there? Well, my, my opinions, of course, are my own. I don't speak in, in behalf of them, but everything that I, I've known about that or heard rumored about it has come from my work outside of the Bureau anyway. So um, you can go to their website into what they call the vault, and I think that and JFK were the number one requested files, the ones that people viewed online. 
And there, there is some documents up there, uh, one from Hoover, I think, um, the Army in 47 or 48, somewhere around there. Uh, I think it was the Army Air Force that asked um, for the FBI's help in investigating, and you see a response from Hoover saying, hey, uh, we'd be glad to help, but we need your full disclosure and cooperation. And it mentions something about um, a time where they, they tried to get a hold of a disc. I think it says disc, either that or wreckage, but that the army had come along and scooped it up before they were they got there. So so you're you're seeing that way back in the late forties there's no real good coordination between the agencies that we're trying to investigate. And even when um Air Force said that they were out of the uh, the UFO business, you know, in '69 after Project Blue Book closed. Um, there are still reports. There are still, um, I guess, well, there's there's a good there's a couple good books out there. One of them is is uh, strictly about that FBI files, and and kind of showing that yeah they've been involved, um, you know, even even since Blue Book that it's rumored, and again, I have no proof of this, no proof whatsoever other than it's um, anecdotal, that there there are not only within the Bureau but other agencies that have designated people who will follow up on these types of events. So I guess that's kind of where you have the, the X-Files spin off and saying that there's a real X-Files. And um, I can tell you from within the Bureau, they kind of, they definitely joke about that because <laughs> if there is such a division, it's not well known. I, I wouldn't even know how, you know, it would, uh, you know, who it would go to or what they would do with it because it's not, it's not what they investigate um, officially. You know, they, they did officially investigate some cattle mutilations um, during the seventies, you know, so if you, I think that's online there as well. You know, this, this rash of, uh, of deaths, especially in Colorado and New Mexico, and they were called in to see what was going on. And um, from what I remember, they they attributed a lot to kind of natural causes and things, but there were some that they couldn't be explained. Well, a lot of things can't be explained, but we just have to keep uh, keep doing our research to find the truth. Um, and by the way, uh, got a couple of questions. Um, in regards to searching for the truth. Uh, the, these might be kind of sensitive questions, but the way things have been going in this day and age, I, I think it's um, a fair question. You said you worked on national security details. I, I can understand maybe that was a little different, um, the way that that phrase national security was handled back in um, when you were working in the FBI. But many people would assert nowadays, it seems like whenever the government wants to get involved in our lives in ways they're not supposed to have authority to do, or if they're trying to hide something from us, be it UFOs or or whatever, they will always try to use the excuse of national security. We need to take your rights in the name of national security. We need to hide this information of you because it would endanger national security if we showed it. Um, do you have a general um, take on that whole governmental attitude that they seem to be taking to an extreme today? And if, um, and if it does piss you off the way they're going about it, do you uh, have any uh, statements you'd like to make to the rest of the people in the general public who can't stand it when the government uses that national security excuse to justify tyranny and hiding things from us? Well, I, I can understand, I think, that the apprehension that most people feel is is based on the fact that they don't know what they don't know. So it's it's kind of like you, you can let your imagination go wild on, on what they're keeping tabs on or what you think they're interested in. You know, I remember back when I was working, it was like, oh, they're looking at your, your library records and stuff. And what you have to realize is that they're, they're very limited in staff and, and in ability. If people realized how difficult it is to get a warrant and all the red tape and stuff you have to go through to even interview a suspect in a case, it's not easy. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with our enemies having that perception that they know all and see all, but the truth is it's, it's very um, targeted and isolated to actual case, to actual threats. So, you know, for the most part, I, I really think it's, it's just kind of this unknown that makes people nervous that, you know, things are national security. Whereas there are good men and women working um, in our behalf around the clock. And by and far, 
the uh, the, mo- the majority of them are very patriotic. They're very above board. The laws that are passed are for the good, you know, of the country. Um, I understand the apprehensions, though. You know, when we hear about things about NSA coming out with, you know, keeping records of all cell phones and things like that, and you, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt, though, and realize that even though that information is available uh, to them they don't have the manpower to just be randomly going to see, you know, what somebody ate for breakfast today or <laughs> what they're doing or it's just, it's just not necessary, you know? So we're just in an ever changing world and we're always going to have to balance that with um, how much we give up in Liberty versus security. And I'm very, very big on Liberty, you know, and that's, and that's why we, we have the agencies. Um, they're overseen by Congress, and um, we we should have the ability to check in with them and see, you know, what's the new thing, what's going on, and make sure we balance those powers. Well said, Ben. Well said, and we just got to make sure we're we're doing it in an in an intelligent way. There's, of course, the Benjamin Franklin attitude: give up liberty for security, and you will get neither. And lose both but then again there's some people in the public who just won't go along with that even though the evidence throughout history shows it's real but um let's switch gears for a moment uh one thing we mentioned in the last interview uh that i didn't have time to get into you did briefly mention i think this was in the conversation that i had about bigfoot i believe the conversation about um that you mentioned the loch ness monster um among other uh paranormal things and i just want to get your take on this Giorgio Tsoukalos, um, uh, from the base known as from the Ancient Aliens TV show, he had uh, another TV show that he, that he did where he was a star in, and one of the things that he researched was was the Loch Ness monster, and what also came up in conversation was Champ, the um, Loch Ness monster, so to speak, that's in Lake Champlain in Vermont. There is a well-known picture of that that was taken of um, of Champ that nobody has been able to prove a fake. And I did mention mm-hmm. in my last um, interview that Bigfoot, according to Akasha Records readers, among other people, is actually a higher dimensional entity that is temporarily incarnating as an ape-like creature in our reality to wake people up to the fact that paranormal things do actually exist. And I can't help but wonder if the same thing is true with the Loch Ness Monster and maybe Champ as well. But the interesting thing is Giorgio Tsoukalos discovered that in both Lake Champlain and in Loch Ness, there is a very high quartz crystal content and anyone in the metaphysics community who looks into crystals and such could tell you that crystal is a very powerful um powerful object they would say for all intents and purposes crystals are living rocks and quartz crystal can both used as an as an antenna to receive energy and also transmit energy so one could hypothesize that the quartz crystal could play a huge role in making it possible for a paranormal entity like lock like um nessie the loch ness monster or champ to exist in um lake champlain so now that i brought that to your attention do you think maybe this is an a, a subject that would require a lot for the research that can among other things the connection uh between quartz crystal and um paranormal activity like uh, loch ness monster maybe even bigfoot um, yeah, I mean, I've always had an open mind to that. As crazy as it sounds, uh, if you call it interdimensional or, um, you know, what, whatever it is, it's, first of all, for mainstream science to look at it, first they've got to acknowledge that there is a phenomenon, and, and they're not even to that point yet. You know, they're, most of the mainstream science is always going to dismiss things such as Loch Ness or uh, Bigfoot as just misidentifications, um, you know, bears and all sorts of things. But they won't even acknowledge yet that people have had legitimate sightings of something tangible, something real that is that is not a known creature. So first you have to get past that point. Um, then you've got that camp of cryptozoology who's just barely, there's still a lot of diehard you know, legitimate scientists who've kind of crossed over that line. Okay, maybe we have an undiscovered creature, but they're not willing to look at how it might bleed over into other phenomena. So they they won't say, uh, no, interdimensional, that's absurd. You know, that's that's what they're saying. And so when you get enough people who are willing to research things such as, you know, energies and 
crystals and stuff. That's the next leap. And, and I, I would be open to that. I, I think I may have said it on your, your show before, but I, I really don't know that there's, you start to get to the point where that seems like the more rational explanation. I mean, how can you otherwise say people are having legitimate physical uh, experiences with seeing huge creatures disturbing the water, you know, or coming literally face to face with Bigfoot, you know, shaking a camper trailer, looking at a thing in the face. It's not a man in a costume. How can you have that experience yet? No one's ever shot a dead one or shot one dead. No one's ever found a dead body. Nobody's ever um, produced anything, you know, other than possible samples of hair and scat that we can't identify. But that doesn't mean it's a new creature. It just means it's there's not enough information to identify it. So, you know, where is this thing going? So to me, I have to say the interdimensional thing is more and more a possibility. And when you look at scientists being open uh, to hypothesizing on string theory and, and alternate universes or whatever you want to call it, um, I think we, we might be surprised, you know, down the line to find that, uh, hey, maybe just like ghosts, which seem to um, occupy the same physical location, but are only seen briefly, either randomly or, um, you know, by will somehow make themselves appear why not animals and that's kind of where i'm at with it well why not why not a, a giant extinct sort of a dinosaur who once lived in that location you know still disturbing the waters there or something i i really have no idea but i think it would be worth looking into I do as well. And I noticed on your uh, bio here on your site, uh, you point out that many people will um, recite the phrase, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, that kind of reminds me one of the more uh, comical instances where someone mentioned that phrase was uh, if anybody ever saw the um, reptilian alien episode of Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura, when Jesse Ventura confronted David Icke and said, okay, I'll believe that reptilian aliens exist when I see them, so why can't I see them? And Ike said they operate in another frequency outside visible light, and Jesse Ventura said, oh, you can't see them, so they're imaginary. And Ike was like, you know, not everything you can see is everything that there is. Visible light is only 0.005% of everything that is, and well, the, the rest of the argument, I don't really need to get into what happened there. It didn't work out too well. It, it, it was really unpleasant, but yeah, I'm, I don't know. I guess you're laughing because maybe you did see that. But anyway, uh, the whole issue of I believe it when I see it, it's a very left brain, closed minded attitude that a lot of people have. And I just out of curiosity, if someone says that to you, uh, what would you um, what would your response be? Would it be not everything you can see is everything that there, there is or would you actually give a different response to that? Well, I, I think it's very arrogant. To be honest, I, I, I had a professor once who taught a class called Does ET Exist? And basically, it was some, you know, fun, good science talking about what it would require for spaceships to travel to other worlds and, you know, are they carbon based life forms and all this stuff. And well, at the end of the semester, his final day, everything he just taught us, he went through line by line and tried to dismantle our hopes, you know, that there was extraterrestrial life. And just absurd things. He would say like, well, science knows 99% of everything there is to know about theory. And if we make new discoveries, it will only be variations on these uh, theories that we know to be fact now. And I thought, how arrogant, how very arrogant, because it wasn't that long ago, you know, when um, we're talking a matter of a couple hundred years, you know, when uh, Newton and his laws of physics, you know, were, were uh, well, had actually replaced um, Copernicus and, and um, theories of that were then replaced after Newton with, you know, Einstein. Uh, Newtonian laws were revised somewhat, you know, theory of relativity. And now we're looking at string theory and things which further revise Einstein. So the more people say they know you know that what is what is uh, this and that in science? I think the less we really know. There's just so much that we don't understand, and 
it's very arrogant to say just because I can't see it physically. You know, I just, I, I try not to laugh when I hear people say this. There's other ways of knowing in the world. And this grand plan, the grand scheme of what we're a part of, I don't think that it's necessary for, for us to know everything right now through our physical senses. There's another way of knowing. You know, and that's where religion comes in. That's where faith comes in. That's where life after death and, and a belief in that comes in. You know, if, if there is life after death and there's other what we call dimensions, you know, um, maybe it's it's not in the plan for us to have complete access to that right now. You know, but those things are just as real as if uh, to, to some people seeing, touching, or feeling it can have the same impact on someone's life. And so I always tell those people, well, look, you know, take the analogy of your heart. Do you have a heart? Yeah, I have a heart. Do you have a brain? Yeah, I have a brain. How do you know? Well, because I'm able to talk. I'm able to live. Okay, well, you see the effects of it. Have you ever seen your brain? Well, I once had an MRI done. Okay, no, that's, that's a representation of your brain. That's not your brain. Have you ever seen your heart? Well, I've seen, um, you know, I've, I've had the uh, pulsometer or something, you know, linked up to it, and I see the beating of it. Okay, but you're seeing the effects of it. You've never seen your heart. So how do you know it's there? Without you opening up your chest and, and taking a look at it, how do you know you have one? You know, and so it, it's it's stupidity, but we can see the effects um, of anything that, you know, you get into the paranormal, for example, and you can see the effects that um, having a, a ghost encounter has on somebody, the, the way it makes you feel, the, the things that you see. There have been, I think, some, some pretty good photos and videos of possible um, evidence. But even if there weren't, these, these experiences are just as real to these people. And you can't discount millions and millions of these experiences. They're all hallucinating. Everyone who's seen a UFO is on drugs or drinking um, or, you know, has mental problems. It's ridiculous. So just because, you, yeah, you can't even physically see these things or, or don't have good physical evidence of it does not mean that it doesn't exist. Damn straight on that one. Uh, time for one more question here. I noticed in your bio, it, it says that you uh, believe firmly in the importance of volunteerism and disaster preparedness and uh we'll give you a lot of credit for that one there sure are a lot of disasters that happen and uh they they're saying there's going to be a lot more disasters in the near future because mother earth as a planet is evolving and expanding its consciousness and as such it has to like uh shed its outer layer for that to happen so they say well there'll be more earthquakes and such so the disaster preparedness people are definitely going to be working uh over time in the in the very near future i'm sure uh, you've served on your community cert team and the disaster um action team for the american red cross um one of the one thing about disaster preparedness some people might say is you, you really it's really a bit unhealthy attitude to to obsess about disasters all the time because if you dwell and worry about something then you're going to attract it um into your life uh you reap what you sow if you if you will and that's kind of a manifestation of it and other people would say that the best way to prepare for a disaster just keep a, a positive mind because like i just said you uh you you reap what you sow but and that means that if you keep having a positive mind and think that good things would happen and work hard to make good things happen then you won't necessarily have to worry about disaster and of course there's the uh like the um hundredth monkey effect kind of um thing well sort of like um related to the hundredth monkey if, uh, thing where if you can get a lot of people to meditate together and expand love throughout throughout um the cosmos or whatever then they can cause a decrease in the amount of um <clears throat> disasters natural disasters that could happen in a given area uh, I'm, I'm i'm guessing that's kind of out of the realm of what you did when you worked on disaster preparedness but um why don't you uh, briefly in the couple minutes we have left tell us about disaster preparedness what you're focused on and do you think maybe having a metaphysical attitude like i've uh, just mentioned could perhaps be the best way of handling disaster preparedness um well i don't i don't know anything about you know, the positive thinking, diverting it. I don't, I don't, haven't heard of any studies effectively showing that. 
I think it's always good to have a positive attitude, but, but hope is not a strategy either. You know, you can't just hope that, you know, tell that to the people in Katrina, they hoped that the hurricane would, you know, change direction. And so they just sat there at home like, Oh, I'm not going to evacuate. I'll be fine. I'm not going to, you know, heed the warnings and, and look what happened. And you could hope that FEMA is going to show up and that they're going to be there within, you know, two, three days. But the reality is they weren't, it took weeks, you know, hundreds of people dead and, um, sewage and disease and billions and, you know, dollars of damage. And it's, it's not a good strategy. So, um, I've always been taught since I was little to be prepared, you know, for, for basically anything, however insignificant the, the occurrence might be. And I heard you at the top of your show talking about like the movie theater shooting and stuff. Um, you know, I'm also a firearms instructor and, and I'm very big on being prepared because, uh, although news would have you believe these incidents are going up, which they're not, um, I don't really care if the significance of them or if the frequency goes up or not. I myself have always been responsible and accountable to me, to me and my family. No one else, um, has that responsibility primarily. And, and that's what I think the big problem is, because the more and more our society becomes entitled to certain things, we think that others are going to take care of us. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. You might have programs that can help you and assist you, but um, accountability is, is like the, the rock of independence, of, of personal accountability. And, and so I think it's not much to ask for people to have the basics of food and water and emergency supplies um, and all of that, you know, to, to first take care of themselves. And, and when it comes to, you know, self-defense, same, same type of thing. It may not be everybody's um, thing. You know, they, they feel like, you know, I'm afraid of guns or I'm afraid of taking self-defense classes. I'm just going to hope for the best. And that's okay. It's not right or wrong. You know, that's just the way they choose to live. But you can't come back and then, you know, be upset. Uh, well, I guess you could be upset, but, uh, you know, like they've done studies and the people who found themselves in these uh, mass shootings, they can get over the physical scars usually. Um, but the number one thing that, that can last a lifetime is the feeling of helplessness, a feeling like there's nothing you could do. And that, to me, is one of the worst feelings in the world. And that's why I'm into preparedness. That's why I'm into instructing people to safely use guns, to get the proper legal permits to carry them. Um, and when it comes to disaster preparedness, my family started a, an expo called PrepperCon. So we're expanding. We will be going to other cities in the U.S., but we had over you know, 10,000 people which is really good for one of these types of events and everything you want to know, you know, there's, there's, um, vendors there telling you how to, uh, do homesteading, you know, raising your own chickens and rabbits, if that's your thing, or hydroponics, growing your own food indoors to solar power, you know, to, um, what type of investments should I make all these different things. And you don't have to be a fanatic. That's the bad thing is that, it's it's rather silly when, when people label somebody who wants to just, you know, do a little bit to be prepared. Oh, well, don't be too prepared. You're a fanatic. You know, so um, I don't know. It, there, there's a balance there, but definitely to your point, just kind of hoping that things are going to be good. I, I, I don't agree. I mean, that's not a strategy. I, I think it's always in disaster. Your attitude is extremely important. So you will attract opportunities in your life. You will attract um, maybe better outcomes. But we're, we're talking about, you know, affecting major disasters and things that just maybe it's not in the cards that a few, you know, good intention people are, are going to deter that. So I think you need to, you know, do your own preparation. 
Yes, you do. And and I just want to clarify, I don't want people to think, well, I don't have to do nothing because if I think happy things and it's going to come to me, you have to understand uh, there's a lot of other people involved in um, in the world and what they think and what they believe is going to have a effect on your life as well. And if they want to, um, and always thinking happy thoughts and thinking you can save the world by being happy and heartwarming all the time is going to save you and everybody else. Well, no, that's a complete total misconception. Reality doesn't really work like that. Just thought I'd clarify that. But uh, this show, since you only wanted to go half an hour, I will uh, bring it to an end. I appreciate you coming on a second time. Uh, so since you came on a second time, you are kind of an exception to the rule of sorts in regards to this little little philosophy that I follow on my show. And uh, with that being said, I guess I'll take this moment to tell you the same thing that I tell all of my guests. Ben, you are a fascinating individual. I have no doubt that if I wanted to, I could do another show with you. But one of my goals with this radio show is to get as many different people on my show as possible before I give any one specific guest double dips, because I feel that that is the fairest, most impartial and most informative way of doing a radio show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. So that does mean I regret to say, Ben, that I will probably not be asking you to come on my show again, but that's only because I need to give thousands of other fascinating individuals the chance to have some glory on my show. But since you did come on a second time, I will definitely combine this interview with the last interview we did and upload it to YouTube. So all this um, important information gets out. And even though I did some UFO related material, um, when you left the last show, just because I wanted to do um, more than just a half hour show, then I'll make sure that in the video description, I uh, give the exact times where you were on. So if people don't want to listen to my annoying speaking, they can listen to your um, fascinating information as well, if that's the way they want to go about it. But it was a pleasure having you on. I hope you got something out of being on my show. I certainly got something out of um, having you on my show. And I do wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. All righty. Well, thank you. I appreciate the invite. I appreciate coming on. All right, Ben. Take care. All righty. Bye-bye. Later. So, folks, that is the end of uh, this um, half an hour special show of sorts. Uh, next uh, week, I am doing two episodes on uh, Monday. I'm going to be having Janice Barcelo on. She was a speaker at the uh, For Your Mind conference in Bucks County that I was at back in April talking about um, traumatic birth and other things and how the powers that be are trying to keep us from having proper births and all and how you're supposed to put the the baby on the mother's heart and all the rest of it. So she's going to talk about that and a couple of other things. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to be having Stuart Swerdlow, who was also on at the uh, Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, it was a Philadelphia Free Market Conference, even though it wasn't in Philly, but he was at that uh, conference as well talking about a lot of things and it seems like whenever Stuart Swerdlow tries to do something, there's always uh, some sort of sabotage going on. Definitely going to be paying attention to see if there's any sabotage involved with him coming on my show. So that's the end of this show. Uh, Janice Barcelo on Monday, uh, Stuart Swerdlow on Wednesday. And then the week after that, I'm actually going to have two guests again, because I'm going to be going to a Mount Shasta in Bermuda the week after that. But I'll talk about that later on. So this is Andrew Fisher uh, signing off. Uh, please excuse me for the uh, be sounding out of it at the be, uh, beginning of the show. I just got, like I said, I just got to my computer because I just gotten out of the shower then. But okay, I'm giving it too much information at this point. So this show is over. What happened in the beginning is of no significance now. This is Andrew Fisher signing off. Enjoy the rest of your trek throughout infinite consciousness, everybody. Namaste.